I didn't expect this movie about Bernie Sanders' life to have so much sex stuff. The world is weird and makes me mad, but at least I get to talk about it with Jose. In December of 2020, the world was given a satirical movie about the life of Bernie Sanders titled Free Lunch Express. It follows Sanders from his early days, starting with his blood pact with Joseph Stalin to his more recent years where he was nearly murdered by Hillary Clinton. Most movies about the lives of politicians don't have a lot of laughs in them, and Free Lunch Express is no exception. Unlike a serious drama such as Spielberg's Lincoln, this movie about the life of Bernie Sanders was supposed to be a comedy. According to its writer-producer-director, Lenny Britton, its mission first and foremost was to be funny. Here's how the movie does a joke. All we've been talking about are ways to take down the man. Why in the hell would we want to become the man? Just think about the Trojan horses. Horse condoms. No. Are you not talking about equine prophylactic? It's only going to get worse from here. The relationship a biopic has to historical facts tells us a lot about what the filmmaker's concerns are. Most politicians have very rich, complex lives, and the details a filmmaker decides to focus on reveals what part of their lives we, as an audience, are being told are most relevant to whatever point the movie is trying to make. A satire is obviously going to take some liberties with the subject's history for the purposes of humor. I'm sure no one watching this movie is going to think that the whole blood pack thing with Stalin actually happened. Nor would anyone assume Bernie Sanders is actually having these Jojo Rabbit-esque moments where he talks to an imaginary Stalin. This stuff is all fine. Well, not fine, it's completely devoid of humor, but conceptually I can understand this attempt at humor being in a satire movie. It still makes sense. The interesting parts of this movie start cropping up from the supposed facts that inform some of these satirical twists, the true events that one would need to make a biopic. These changes to Bernie Sanders' life seem less like an attempt at humor and more like a misunderstanding of the basic facts of his life. Here's one example. In the movie, Sanders goes to Moscow with his first wife for their honeymoon. We're going to Moscow on our honeymoon. Oh, Moscow, <laughs> really? You sure you don't want to just go to Youngstown? Youngstown? Ugh. Seeing Moscow has always been my lifelong dream. The right-wing character of Bernie Sanders is that he's such a committed communist that he went to Moscow for his honeymoon. This isn't the joke, this is the setup for the joke. And if Bernie Sanders' life is supposed to be setting up this comedy, it makes some glaring mistakes with the facts here. Let's go over some of the problems. First off, Sanders and his first wife, Deborah Schilling, never went to Moscow. They were married in the 1960s, and the only traveling they did I could find was a trip to Israel to work on a kibbutz, which was before they married. They were only married for a few years, divorcing in the 1960s. The next problem is Bernie's trip to Moscow happened in the 1980s, and even though it did happen the day after a second marriage to Jane O'Meara, it wasn't a honeymoon, but actually a part of his official business as mayor of Burlington, Vermont. And I should also mention that Sanders' second marriage is depicted in this movie after he becomes senator, in 2007, when in reality it was in 1988. That's a lot of stuff to get wrong. And all of these facts were completely butchered so we can get this scene in Moscow where Sanders' first wife is so disgusted with her honeymoon destination that she divorces him on the spot, and Bertie fakes having sex with her to impress his Soviet comrades who are listening in on them. This exemplifies the movie's relationship with its subject history. The joke isn't, let's pretend Bernie went to Moscow on his honeymoon. The joke is, Bernie faked having sex on his Moscow honeymoon. You have to accept the lie in the premise to get the joke. And the joke isn't even funny, so why bother with any of this? We aren't watching a movie about the life of Bernie Sanders. We're watching a movie about a right-wing character of Bernie Sanders with some bad jokes thrown in. Here's another example. In 1972, Bernie Sanders wrote an essay about gender roles titled Man and Woman for an alternative newspaper that used some rather tasteless creative imagery. It resurfaced in 2015 as part of an article in Mother Jones. And while the spokesperson from his campaign distanced Sanders from the nearly 50-year-old article, some hay was made about Sanders being some kind of s and fanatic. Free Lunch Express takes that misunderstanding from the right and makes this version of Bernie Sanders some kind of sexually repressed guy who's constantly trying to get his s and erotica published. What if the writing thing doesn't work out? I have every confidence that it will. Well, I'm why don't you set your side a little lower? Lower than writing porn? Because I feel like that's pretty sufficiently low. This, I suspect, is the basis for another tasteless joke where we meet Sanders' parents who, for some reason, are really into hooking up. 
We meet them once in the opening scenes, and then later on in the movie when Bernie is campaigning for political office. The joke, I guess, is that older people with an active sex life are funny. The truth is, Sanders' parents had passed away before he was 22, well before he became a politician. Keeping them alive for this lame joke seems pointlessly cruel, and a needless explanation for a lie about Bernie Sanders having some kind of repressed sexuality. There's so many instances like this that I'm not sure how someone can really understand what this movie is saying without having that right-wing character of Sanders in mind. And if you went into this movie having never heard of Bernie Sanders, you would be no closer to understanding most of the basics of his life, aside from him being a politician. I should reiterate that a movie, especially a satire, doesn't need to be completely historically accurate, but when the real parts of a subject's story that are highlighted are complete fiction, it reveals how worthless this movie is in depicting its subject's life. It's a huge waste. And speaking of huge wastes, much to my own personal heartbreak, Malcolm McDowell is in this movie as the narrator. He recently gave an interview about this role in the movie, and to hear him tell it, he was apparently bored, sitting at home without much to do, thought the script was funny enough, and signed on to be the narrator. They asked me to do it, and it was right in the middle of the pandemic. So mm -hmm. when there was nothing happening at all, and they all came up, everyone was in a bubble 12 feet away and masked, and whipped the mask off just to do the shoot. Mm. Um, so it, it was uh, sort of fun. It was fun doing it. I wouldn't be surprised if he had only worked a day or two to deliver all his lines. And wow, to see deliver. Come with me, and as we go on, You'll see exactly what could go wrong. Oh, Bernie. <laughs> Bless his cotton socks. Hammy, over the top, and constantly silly, it's a performance that's both delightful and completely above the likes of this movie. And I feel I have to defend McDowell's honor here. While I don't know for certain what Malcolm McDowell's politics are, I suspect he's not a huge fan of Donald Trump. From what I could gather in that recent interview, he's a Kamala Harris guy. And of course, the vice president's nomination, uh, now the elect, mm -hmm. who is a terrific candidate, I think. I mean, she's really wonderful. So I guess Malcolm McDowell's in the K-Hive. That's better than being MAGA. And in an interview with Salon, McDowell's philosophy on making movies is beautifully summed up by this quote. The whole point with careers is, and I learned this at a young age, you are not going to make that many great movies in your life. So what's one more to the pile, I guess? The narration was designed to fill in the gaps of the plot, sometimes jumping years into the future. Strangely, there are these weird mockumentary-type interviews with a few figures, supposedly from Sanders' past. These interviews only exist in the first 20 or so minutes of the movie, though, and then it just stops using them. Is this movie still a mockumentary if it only keeps it up for the first quarter of the movie? It makes me suspect some ball was dropped during a script rewrite and no one bothered to fix it. What he lacked in intelligence, he made up with sloth. And speaking of lazy, let's look at some more of the humor in this movie. Here's one example where Bernie is getting political advice from Ben and Jerry of Ben and Jerry ice cream fame while getting high in the park. Ben and or uh, Jerry gave Bernie the most unfortunate of ideas. But you're hot. Huh? The joke here, I guess, is that Ben and Jerry are gay. How is this a joke, though? In real life, they aren't, but why would it be funny if they were? Another example of this movie's humor comes when we meet Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez late in the movie. Here we are, two people of different generations trying to take the country downtown to socialism town, Gorillo. <laughs> sure, sure. Sounding completely unlike herself, we see EAOC speaking with an accent and dropping in some casual Spanish. It doesn't really sound like her at all, and even if she did sound like this, why is it funny that she would have an accent? The idea here seems to be that the left is hiding their identity, and when the cameras stop rolling, they reveal the parts of their identity that would supposedly hurt their popularity. But if anything, I think being gay would win Ben and Jerry, who are very supportive of gay rights, more support within that community. And AOC having an accent probably wouldn't bother a district that's 56% Hispanic. But I suspect this movie isn't targeting an audience that might not find humor in two men being gay or a Hispanic woman having an accent. It speaks volumes as to what this movie is trying to pass off as humor. And speaking of that, did you really think a lazy right-wing movie mocking Bernie Sanders wasn't going to have a little bit of anti-Semitism in it? You'll find this way. No, 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 no. Uh, I'm serious about this. Is he going to be a skilled doctor? No. He 
is he going to be a, a shrewd lawyer? <laughs> what are the chances? Well, well, come on, oh, wait, come wait, wait, on, wait, wait, wait. Do you think he'll be a prosperous businessman? Well, it's well, not going to happen. It's the adjectives that really hammer home the Jewish stereotypes here. Ultimately, I think the reason this movie fails so completely is, aside from the lack of talent of almost everyone involved, is it makes no effort to understand its subjects beyond the right-wing caricature of him. Creating a movie that presents its subject in a way only those who despise Bernie Sanders the most would be able to appreciate, and the humor is crafted with this audience in mind. To the average person, at least based on the audience reviews for this movie, none of this stuff is funny. But perhaps we need some perspective. Let's look at a similar movie. In Oliver Stone's W, we get a satirical look at the life of George W. Bush, following him from his days in college right up to his time in office as the 43rd President of the United States. Although a film limited in its scope, and perhaps not as attached to reality as it often presents itself, W does distinguish itself from Free Lunch Express in that it presents a more complete picture of its subject. It shows us the influence of George Bush Sr. on his son, and how W's relationship with him supposedly motivated his drive to be more than a perpetual failure, and to right the wrong he believes his father made in Iraq. We also get a portrait of how the Bush family's privilege carried a mediocre man to the highest office in the land, as he's surrounded by skilled political operatives, and bequeathed his spot in politics by his very successful father. And a number of scenes within this movie are created using verifiable moments from Bush's past, sometimes recreating famous speeches or hearings with the film's performers. Comparatively, Free Lunch Express never explores Sanders' motivation aside from being upset that he was bullied in school. His political ambitions are supposedly driven by stealing campaign money, something I couldn't find any evidence of him having done, and his political success is largely presented as a lucky accident. One interesting similarity these two movies have is how they explain the rises to power by their respective subjects. Sanders and Bush aren't presented too favorably in their respective movies, so their rises to power are similar in that they're both shabby dudes who fail upwards into their success. Both movies advance the idea that neither of these two earned their way into future success. In W, we see shocking ambivalence at times, such as President Bush giving out t-shirts to soldiers wounded in Iraq, and in Free Lunch Express, Bernie never even whispers about Medicare for All until it's time to make a deal with Hillary Clinton. The idea that either of these men could care at all about the people they represent is never seriously considered. Considering Bernie's whole brand is standing up for the little guy, and he has a history of activism and political engagement, Ignoring these parts of his history seemed like a deliberate effort to not understand him as a subject, or at least not present these very real parts of his history. These movies have a lot in common in that respect, and it reveals that making a movie like this is often designed to be a political statement rather than strictly a comedy or a depiction of history. In W, there are some notable omissions regarding the Bush presidency. There's no mention of the terrorist attack on September 11th or the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. It's a movie primarily concerned with trying to understand how the invasion of Iraq happened. And even though it ultimately comes down hard on Bush for his role in the invasion, there's still some strange affection for former President Bush, as we have moments of sympathy for a guy doing the best he can with his limited faculties. In Free Lunch Express, we see Bernie constantly being a scheming, conniving, lazy villain. He's never portrayed as a sympathetic character, with one exception. The only time you'll feel sympathy for Bernie in this movie is when he's faced with an even greater villain. And of course, I'm talking about Hillary Clinton. Although a late arrival into the movie, it's amazing how terrifyingly she's portrayed. She bullies him, mocks him, and even threatens his life. It seems like the Free Lunch Express's hatred for Hillary is so strong that even a movie primarily built around mocking Bernie Sanders has to go out of its way to make sure the audience knows Hillary Clinton is so much worse. And of course, instead of offering a sensible criticism of Clinton, something that's very easy to do, it instead traipses into conspiracy theories, like the Clintons supposedly having Vince Foster murdered. It's also another example of how this movie is really built around right-wing caricatures and an alternate perspective of reality. So of course Hillary Clinton is presented as the most evil person in politics. I've been going pretty hard on Free Lunch Express, but it's also important for us to take a step back from these movies and examine ourselves as the audience. Or, since this is my video, examining myself as the audience. A movie like W would, seemingly, play better to a left-wing person such as myself, and an obviously right-wing movie like Free Lunch Express would not. So my political leanings may be coloring my interpretation here, since these movies are quite clearly shaped by the politics of their respective filmmakers. But while I think W is a better movie than Free Lunch Express, I wouldn't call it good either. It felt long, with way too much emphasis on George W. Bush's daddy issues, and wasn't really that funny. While it was comparatively the funnier of the two movies, being funnier than Free Lunch Express isn't a very tough thing to do. 
But let's take a look at another satirical biopic about a politician, or in this case, eventual politician, one that was made by actual comedians. Funny or Die's 2016 movie, Donald Trump's The Art of the Deal the Movie, gave us a brief history of the eventual 45th President of the United States. Presented as if it were a movie created by Donald Trump back in the 1980s, it has a very 80s aesthetic. The movie has cameos from Alf and Christopher Lloyd. It even has Kenny Loggins' track over the credits. It's a reminder that we used to think of Donald Trump as this ghost from the 80s, desperate to stay relevant in the modern day. But now we think of a lot of other things when talking about this guy. You might not recognize Johnny Depp as Donald Trump, but that's him under all that makeup. He's joined by a host of other performers, many of them quite experienced in doing jokes. And I even popped in myself for a brief cameo. What's your name again? Jose. It's not working out with this kid. Let's go to a commercial. Trump. That game. So was the NFL violating antitrust laws? Although well-received at the time, this movie has not aged well. The Trump jokes, which must have felt fresh in 2016, now come across as boring and stale. The movie does reflect something very important, though. How we look at the lives of these figures is defined largely by the moment in which we look back. Free Lunch Express gives us a look at the life of Bernie Sanders based on a caricature of him taken directly from the present. With his past life rewritten to lead us towards this bumbling communist who secretly loves Stalin. And W is very much the same, giving us a selective look at George W. Bush's history based on the version of him we were seeing as president at the time, with the failure of Iraq looming especially large as his second term in office drew to an end. And the Trump movie is, as I mentioned, a look back at Trump before he assumed office when he was simply an 80s relic. These movies are moments in time trying to stamp a specific understanding of these politicians into the minds of their audience. This understanding will reflect the politics of the filmmaker, and if we're really lucky, it will give us a greater understanding of the subjects. We know Free Lunch Express is no good to us, and W is fixated on one major aspect of the Bush presidency, and the Donald Trump movie only looks at who Trump was before he assumed his role in office. So let's look at one more political satire biopic that very deliberately looks at one politician from a moment in time that might give us a better look at the impact they had on the world. Armando Nucci's 2017 movie, The Death of Stalin, offers a more interesting take on the satirical political biopic. Based on a graphic novel from 2012 by Fabian Nuri and Thierry Robin, its subject, Joseph Stalin, spends most of the movie dead, or almost dead, and we spend the bulk of the movie watching the many men in his orbit scramble to make sense of a nation held together by this one man. It, of course, takes a lot of liberties with historical facts, but it does so in service to a greater narrative about how authoritarian rule does not abide sharing power, and how Stalin structured his government around fear of him. You learn much about the stature he grew to in his final days by seeing the effect his sudden absence had on those around him. We may never understand the inner workings of these political figures, especially when they're dead, but we can learn something of them through art that highlights how silly it is to have a world where the death of one guy can bring the ruling structure of an entire nation to a screeching halt. No doubt, there are plenty of historical inaccuracies in the death of Stalin, and it's jarring to see men who helped commit atrocities being portrayed as bumbling fools, even when the movie makes no attempt to hide their more monstrous sides. Thousands of people die during this movie, and execution scenes are played for laughs. It's a wonderful embodiment of a dark comedy. And it gets away with all of this because it managed to do one thing that Free Lunch Express failed at miserably. The death of Stalin is funny. Look at them, you see? Okay. Those brain thieves. I see you heat me. There's food next I'm door, Stalin, gentlemen, son. please. You will not take me down. I will not go down. Please. I'm sorry. All the faults I found with Free Lunch Express might have seemed like nothing had it made me laugh throughout its runtime. But instead, I sat there with a bored expression, counting each excruciating minute. If you're curious to know what joke got me the closest to laughter, it was this one. So what are we going to call this new political party? The Soviet Union Party. So, it's catchy, don't you think? That's as good as it got. The reasons for Free Lunch Express not being funny vary. One of the main problems is how exhaustively conservative it is. Not with its politics, although it is conservative politically, but rather, it's conservative with its humor. The jokes amount to nothing more than Bernie constantly smoking pot, old people getting frisky, and ham-fisted caricatures. It all feels like something ripped from a comedy 20 years ago. 
One of the taglines of this movie is that it comes from the creators who saw Airplane too many times. That movie came out 40 years ago, and while it holds up in some ways, largely due to the talent of the people who created it, comedy in film has evolved quite a bit since then. Free Lunch Express doesn't seem to have gotten that message. Comedy generally doesn't age well, so borrowing from the past can be a risky thing to do. While sometimes humor is lost through changing values in a culture, and when it comes to making fun of people for their ethnicity or sexuality, that definitely seems like a good thing to me, there's also the simple fact that the more often you hear the same joke, even one that's acceptable, the less funny it gets over time. Some comedy holds up, and some does it, and it takes a sound, comedic mind to know when to replicate and when to innovate. Not pushing the envelope in a way that drags comedy back towards tired cliches, but instead pushing it into new, exciting directions. There is no innovation in Free Lunch Express. It rehashes jokes that have been in movies for decades, and it doesn't do a particularly good job of retelling them. It would be unfair to say politically conservative artists can't be funny, but to be funny to a modern audience, it requires them to be less conservative artistically. There you have it. A tale so curious. It may seem quite spurious. The choices made surrounding the making of this movie raise important questions about the filmmakers involved. Who is writer, director, producer Lenny Britton, and what does he have against Bernie Sanders? Leonard Wheeler Britton currently serves as the lead writer-director for a production company called Right and Funny, a name which is only half right. In his younger days, he worked as a writer before taking over his father's business, Britton Lumber Landscape and Feed. I couldn't figure out exactly what he was writing, though. The most interesting part of his CV is that Britton ran for office in 2010, in Vermont, for the Senate. And while it would have been too perfect had his opponent been Bernie Sanders himself, he instead ran against the other senator from Vermont, Patrick Leahy, who's been holding that seat for decades. Naturally, Britton lost, though the 30% of the vote he got was more than Leahy's last Republican challenger could achieve. And Britton gave us several memorable campaign ads. This is a bill for your family share of the national debt. It's $168,000. This is a joke, right? Miss, we're from the government. There is no joking. That's a lot of money, mister. Better get a paper route, Billy. When one of these ads proved a minor viral hit, nabbing tens of thousands of views compared to the usual few hundred, it convinced Britton and his partner Bradford Broyles to step into the world of comedy. So they decided to make some scripted comedy from a conservative standpoint. As to how a former senatorial candidate got the funding to make a movie, the answer to that lies with the executive producer for the film, Lenore Broughton. Broughton is an heiress living off the fabulous wealth of her late grandfather, Sewell Avery, a businessman from the early half of the 20th century whose fortune was estimated to be $327 million when he retired in 1955. Although very little is known about Broughton, as she is a very private person, one thing very much publicly available is her extensive support of Republican politicians, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars every election cycle, typically on hard-right candidates. And naturally one of those candidates included Britain's run for Senate in 2010. Broughton has helped finance a number of right-wing media outlets, such as True North Reports, which a brief glance at reveals plenty of right-wing nonsense, right down to reposting clips from Tucker Carlson's nightly hour of trash. Broughton apparently saw some value in Britain's vision for a movie mocking Bernie Sanders, and as is predictable, this isn't the first time she's financed his ad techs. Aside from those campaign contributions, she's also financed a few of his other projects, such as a web series, News Done Right, mocking Vermont Republican Governor Phil Scott for being far too moderate, and she also financed a web series that I've been told is a comedy starring Kevin Sorbo titled The World According to Billy Potwin. Although the series was originally Sorbo-less, he joined in its second season, replacing the previous actor who had the role of Nate Potwin, the patriarch of the Potwin clan, and of the four shorts produced in the Sorbo era, three were cut into a single episode, which seems to be serving as a pilot for the series. Here's a little taste of what this show is like. And if we do not reduce our carbon footprint, the polar caps will melt and the rising sea level will put major American coastal cities underwater. So New York, Miami, and Los Angeles underwater. What's the downside? Billy! Billy's grandfather is played by Barry Bostwick of Rocky Horror and Spin City fame. I can only hope he just really needed the money, especially since they spelled his name wrong in the credits. You may recognize the actor who played young Bernie Sanders in Free Lunch Express, taking on the role of Billy Potwin. This young man is named Jonah Britton, and he is the son of series creator Lenny Britton. 
Although it had a very brief run online, this web series got a full season with at least eight episodes produced so far. Though they have yet to air, it doesn't seem to have a distributor yet. But if it gets one, I'll make a whole video looking at what I'm sure will be a fantastic sitcom. There's some sweet irony here where a wealthy financier who didn't earn a cent of her own money is financing an unfunny former politician to make bad entertainment for a right-wing audience who wants to fuel their hatred for Bernie Sanders. When Bernie is presented as a hopeless slacker who lucked his way into his position, it seems a more fitting description for those responsible for this lazily put-together movie, financed on the back of inherited wealth and constructed by someone who doesn't appear to have any talent whatsoever for comedy. Free Lunch Express is a movie that demands a response that's as lazy as the effort that went into making it. A waste of time for everyone involved. I encourage all of you to keep not watching it. Originally, this video was actually going to be entirely about the whole Billy Potwin series, but there were only a few shorts and it didn't feel quite so meaty, and I wasn't sure there was enough content there for me to make a whole video. While doing my research, I decided to watch Free Lunch Express just to get a sense of what Britain is all about in his creative work, and there was so much there that I just felt like it would make a much better subject for a video. And there were so many things in this movie I didn't even get to touch that were just absolutely atrocious. So consider this a sanitized reading of the movie that doesn't bombard you with every last morsel of its garbage. If you enjoyed this movie, you can contribute to this channel by becoming a patron or a member. You'll get your name in the credits like these lovely people. You also get early access to videos and downloads to my theme songs. And I'm trying to create regular blog posts every month on my Patreon and in community posts for members just to keep people in the loop on what's happening with the channel and what new videos are coming down the line. So that's a nice extra as well. If you'd like to support the channel in a non-monetary way, you can like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. Thank you so much for watching.